Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to MST.TV. This is Nishi here bringing you all another Market Watch episode. So, in today's episode, we are actually going to be a bit more forward looking, observing trends in the market now and the potential implications that they'll have down the road. Of course, I think the biggest one that everyone has kind of been talking about recently is collector's rares as the newest, hottest rarity out of Toon Chaos. I'll share with you guys just my own opinions about the new rarity and where I think those cards are going to be headed in the future. Of course, we also have the potential potential for several new archetypes to receive new support, so we'll talk a little bit about a few of those. And then of course we're right in the middle of reprint season with Battles of Legend, the 2020 Megatons, and a new gold series all announced for later this year, so we're gonna want to keep our eyes peeled for news about those sets and be ready to take action. Let's jump into today's episode. Alright, so to kick things off, I do want to talk a little bit about collector's rares. So just as kind of a precursor to what I'm going to talk about here, we need to kind of establish that collector's rares are entirely different from any other rarity that we've seen in Yu-Gi-Oh! before. So in terms of your ability to pull a collector's rare, right, I would say that it's comparable to a ghost or a starlight rare in that you're looking at having to open multiple boxes in order to pull one. Although, of course, you're going to be pulling about three collector's rares per case, as opposed to one starlight rare in every two cases or one ghost rare in every case. The similarity is that they're not something that you're going to just be pulling out of every single box. And the fact that you're pulling much less than one in every box means that they're going to be similarly sought after for being that much harder to find. However, they're somewhat similar to ultimate rares as well in that there is a much larger pool of cards that you're pulling from. So before, when you had any hollow or rare in the set that could be an ultimate rare, you could be really lucky and you could pull like an ultimate rare cyber dragon, or you could be unlucky and pull an ultimate rare DD trap hole. So even though it's relatively easy to pull an ultimate rare, or it's relatively easy to pull a collector's rare as opposed to a starlight or a ghost rare, it's harder to pull the specific one that you're looking for. Ultimately, I think that the collector's market has made it pretty clear over the last couple of years with all of the different crazy price spikes that we've seen, that collectible cards, particularly those that are more iconic, are going to appreciate in price over time. Those cards like Ultimate Rare Raviel, Haman, Uriah, Ultimate Rare Shining Flare Wingman, Ghost Rare Stardust and Black Rose Dragon, right? All of these super iconic cards in the game, those are among the cards that have jumped up the highest in price. And while other Ultimate Rares, for example, have appreciated in value, it's the iconic ones that will truly see some crazy prices. I'm definitely expecting to see a similar thing happen with the collector's rares. Overall, I think that the trend we're going to see is the same. We've seen some buyouts of collector's rares really early on, but I think it's just kind of people jumping the gun and wanting to get ahead of the curve, but it's still too early, right? People are still opening products, so maybe some of the prices drop back down a little bit because there's still more quantities being pushed out onto the market, even if it is relatively slowly with a set that is as limited in production as Toon Chaos. However, I think that really over time, we're going to see the iconic collector's rares, right? Like the Black Luster Soldier, the Chaos Emperor Dragon, the Stardust Dragon, and the Pot of Extravagance really get up there in terms of price as time goes on and appreciate in value the most. Now, that's not to say that the other collector's rares will go down because I think they will also go up in price as time goes on. However, I think that the ones with the greatest potential for return and the ones that will hit the highest peaks, even in terms of like percentage gained, are those iconic cards that everyone kind of knows and loves. So when I have people who have pulled collector's rares ask me, should I be holding on to this or picking some up, or should I be looking to sell collector's rares, my general response is that you should be holding on to them unless you get like a really, really solid offer. Obviously, if you need the cash, you should probably sell them because it's not worth holding on to cards at that point. But if you like pull the collector's rare BLS and you're fine holding on to it for a few years and waiting for it to appreciate in value, unless you get a crazy offer that's like 100% of full retail value going into your pocket, I think Think that the collector's rares a lot like the ghost rares and the starlight rares are worth holding on to for when they inevitably go up in price in the future now i have actually seen some people discussing rewaves of tomb chaos and how those would affect the overall prices of collector's rares now my understanding is that there's a second wave of tomb chaos that's expected to be coming out around august though i've heard different things about it being first edition or unlimited and whether or not that's in europe or north america we don't really have anything too concrete at this point now a big thing that we don't know about yet is whether or not there's going to be collector's rares in the unlimited version of the set assuming that the rewave is unlimited 
because with starlight rares for example right we know that starlight rares can only come in first edition packs but with ultimate rares and ghost rares those could come either first edition or unlimited now if there's none in the unlimited packs then of course we would expect the collector's rares to skyrocket in terms of price since they would be that much harder to find However, if there is an unlimited version of the collector's rare cards, then I would expect rather than dragging down the prices of the first eds, I think that the unlimiteds would simply come in at a fraction of the price of the first eds. If you're wanting to go out of your way to collect these high rarity cards, right, you would obviously want them in first edition. So getting an unlimited version would kind of be like taking a trade off for an inferior product. A really big example of this is looking at ghost rare first edition Stardust Dragon, which is like over a thousand dollars versus an unlimited ghost rare Stardust dragon which comes in still expensive but only at around two to three hundred dollars so like 30 percent of the cost i think that either way we do see the first edition collector's rares retain value now if we get a second wave of first edition products though then i actually think that naturally in the short term this will cool off prices and we will see a lot of collector's rares dip because there's a very natural increase in the supply of cards and the increase in supply is going to result in a decrease in the price I think that one of the biggest drives behind the high prices of Toon Chaos cards that we're seeing is definitely because of the issues with production and so little quantity of the set being available on the market. So definitely we could see a bunch of cards dip and I think that a big factor would be people panic selling and thinking that their cards are going to be worth so much less with another first edition wave. However, ultimately I think that in terms of the long term strategy, right, the collectors rare first editions, especially those iconic ones, are going to hold even if they dip in the short term. Long term, I think that something like a collector's rare BLS is still going to retain a lot of value and definitely appreciate in price. So for me personally, I'm holding on to the two copies that I was able to pick up relatively early to potentially sell them further down the road at a much higher value. All right, so let's take a look at a few different archetypes that are potentially receiving support in the near future and some of the buyouts that have been associated with them. So these are more than just your average random, hey, this archetype could be cool if they got some support. The archetypes we're looking at here have a bit more reason behind why we're looking at them. So first up, Gustos are one of the decks that could potentially receive a new structure deck if they're in one of the top two spots on the current poll taking place in the OCG. Gustos are an archetype that never really took off, largely due to the fact that basically all of their main deck monsters missed timing, which made them really bad to use as synchro materials, which is what the deck primarily tried to do. Hopefully, new Gusto support would help them to fix this problem, but for now we're primarily seeing some of the more potentially useful synchro monsters get bought out as opposed to the main deck cards, and mostly just the dual terminal versions as the highest rarity. This should come as no surprise, since DT cards are always among the first cards to be bought out, even though a lot of the time the prices don't really stick. So Digustos Freeze is the first one we're going to talk about, and this is one that has even the secret rare version bought out, because it's the one that's most likely to actually see play if the deck ends up really being good. It gets you any Gusto card back from your graveyard, so even if the deck gets a new spell or trap, it's potentially a really good card nevertheless for maintaining resource advantage. Now with Sfreeze, the DT version is up to $19 a piece, and even the Secret Rare version is $8, and there are very limited quantities available on TCG Player at the moment. Digusto Eagles is a card that is a bit more situational as you can banish a wind monster from your graveyard to pop an opponent's face down card, but only during your end phase, so maybe not the most useful card. DT copies are about $8 each as it is an ultra rare DT card, though regular secret rares are still under a dollar, the card probably isn't going to be played at all. And then finally, Guldos is a potentially interesting card, letting you shuffle two Gusto monsters from your graveyard back to the deck to destroy a face-up monster on your opponent's field, which is potentially really interesting because not only do you get the pop, you also get to help put back resources into your deck. Overall, I think that it would take a lot of work to make Gustos a viable deck, and even if they do, I think that outside of Sfreeze, none of the existing cards for the archetype are really that amazing and worth picking up at the moment. These are more just cards that you should be aware of so that you can pick them up if they're cheap for an easy flip, or you should let go of them if you find someone who's really hyped up to build the deck. 
Next up, we'll take a look at Ice Barriers, and this is the archetype that I personally think seems really intriguing. Ice Barriers were always kind of overlooked because their synchros were so powerful, but their main deck monsters were really, really bad. Everyone knows about using Trishula to loop hands, or Brianak to clear boards, or Deloran for infinite loops, but no one really knows what any of the main deck monsters do. However, a new structure deck could definitely change that because the deck does have some really interesting cards. It just never really worked together as a cohesive strategy. Dance Princess of the Ice Barrier is a potentially interesting card to use to set up OTKs and it doesn't actually cause you to lose any card advantage to use its effect. It does have the added bonus of being from Star Strike Blast, so even if it doesn't see play with the new cards, expect it to spike up in value significantly anyways just because of the set it's from. In fact, at the moment for instance, there are no copies of this card available on TCG Player, so expect whoever lists the first few back up to put it at some ridiculous price point. I talked briefly about Medallion of the Ice Barrier in the last Market Watch as a common from Star Strike Blast that is a Rota for any monster in the entire archetype, and even though the card will likely be reprinted in a structure deck down the road when it is released, the card will still probably jump up in value in the short term. It has already gone from being about 25 to 50 cents to almost being a $2 card, so it's something that's probably worth digging out of your bulk to flip while you still can. Finally, there are a couple of DT cards that are worth noting, and the one that I'm showing here is General Grunard. This one lets you conduct an additional normal summon or set this turn for an Ice Barrier monster, though as a level 8, this is going to be a little bit harder to get out. However, if they have anything that's able to summon an Ice Barrier monster from your hand or deck, it could definitely be a really important combo extender used to help build boards and proc effects, so I think it's potentially really useful. Apparently, other people think so as well, because there are currently no available Near Mint DT copies on TCG Player for this card either. Personally, I am really rooting for Ice Barriers to win the poll because I think they have some really interesting cards in the archetype and could potentially do some really cool things in the right situation, so I have my fingers crossed Trust, but we'll see what happens. Alright guys, the last archetype that I'll mention here is Infernities. So in the OCG, there is an exclusive tournament pack that provides reprints of different cards, and typically the cards from those packs hint at different archetypes that are going to receive additional support in the near future. Now one of the archetypes hinted at from that set is Infernities, which is one of those decks that set up unbreakable boards before it was the thing that everyone was trying to do. Because of this, people are still jumping on some of the Infernity cards here in the TCG as well, despite Archfiend and Barrier still being limited. Now, Infernity Necromancer is a really key card in the deck as it isn't a hard once per turn and you can use it to summon out Archfiend from your graveyard every time it hits the field. The DT version of Necromancer as the highest rarity is about $14 a piece at the moment, which is pretty up there. Now, an interesting card here is Infernity Mirage, a card from the Shining Darkness that has actually never been reprinted, which is going for about $15 a piece at the moment. Now, this one is from a fairly old set, so it is pretty difficult to find, especially in near mint condition, and it has actually been around $8 to $10 for quite a while, so not as crazy as a price jump as you would have initially thought, but it is still worth noting. However, the fact that it basically allows you to use Archfiend twice, because you can bring back Archfiend as well as Necromancer, and then Necromancer can bring back another Archfiend means that the card could be a really strong card in the deck if it does get this suspected support. Finally, Secret Rare Stygian Street Patrols are about $20 for Unlimited and $30 for the first deads. This card is basically just another way to help special summon Infernity Archfiend, but this card has actually always been fairly expensive due to its demand over in the OCG. Stygian Street Patrol is a card that went for a really long time in the OCG without ever really receiving a reprint, even when we had the tin version re-released over here. So a lot of people would bring Stygian Street Patrols over to the OCG in order to resell them. So yeah, personally, I've never been really that fond of Infernities. My friend Y played them really religiously and it was always really interesting to watch him top deck Archfiend like every other game. Hopefully if we do see the archetype get some new support, that would also mean that we have a chance to see cards like Archfiend and Barrier gradually released off of the ban list. And finally guys, in sticking with our forward looking theme, let's take a look at a couple of reprint sets that we have coming up for the rest of 2020. So we have multiple reprint sets announced already in Battles of Legend, the 2020 Megatins, and the upcoming Gold series, all of which are being released within the next three to four months. With that, we have to be extremely careful of what cards we're holding on to and what quantity of cards we're going to be holding on to, since a single reprint could absolutely tank a card's value. 
It is necessary then to take note of cards that have already had their reprints confirmed, try to pay attention to their prices, and offload them before they have a chance to tank too far if they haven't already. So first up, we have Battles of Legend Armageddon, which is coming out in just under a month, which isn't really that far away at all, especially when we take into consideration the fact that we don't have events on at the moment. Now despite this, and despite some of the confirmed reprints that we're seeing, a few cards remain pretty high in price. Mecha Phantom Beast O-Lion is just a rare that will be getting a hollow reprint, yet it still carries a $17 price tag and is absolutely something that should be let go of. You have a free hollow upgrade coming out within the next month and it's probably going to be available for less than five dollars a piece so i would absolutely let go of my rare copies now artifact sanctum is a 10 to 12 dollar card depending on the rarity though it'll be getting a reprint that is also either an ultra or secret rare the exact same as the existing rarities for the card sanctum is actually a card that isn't really seeing much play at the moment either so if you can move them for around 10 dollars each you should be able to buy them back for only two to three dollars a piece so i would recommend even moving the set that you would normally keep to play with while we have no events going on and then buying them back soon after Finally, Madolce Angeli finally has its reprint coming, being very necessary after we saw reprints of Madolce Magelline and Madolce Chocola a la Mode in Dual Overload, but this is still a $40 card for either the original Ultra or the Megaton Ultra reprint of this card, which is really just insane to me. When we take a look at Magelline, it tanked from being a $25 to $30 card to barely being a $1 card now, and I'd honestly expect Angeli to be at most a $5 card following its reprint. Even in a worst case scenario, right, say you maybe pay $20 for your playset of reprint Angelis, you can move your set now for $120, say like $100 now, right, that's $80 of profit that you're making, and you still get a set of Angelis out of it just for moving your set of a card a little bit earlier, this one feels like a no-brainer to me. Of course, we do have the Megatons later this year as well, so in the Megatons, we're confirmed to be getting reprints of cards from Savage Strike. Dark Neo Storm, Rising Rampage, and Chaos Impact, potentially other cards, and we do know that we are getting some OCG imports as well, cards like Red Eyes, Darkness, Dragoon, but anything from these four core sets, I would be kind of wary of holding on to. We've already seen reprints of Phantasmae and Pot of Extravagance, so we're looking primarily at cards like IP Mascarena, Borolod Savage Dragon, and Mech Knight Crusadia Avermax. These are kind of like the more expensive cards from these sets, that carry higher price tags but will also definitely tank with the Megaton reprints. Now technically these reprints aren't confirmed yet, but I would assume that they're going to be included in the Megatons, or at least in Battles of Legend, I'd be really surprised if they didn't get reprinted. They would most certainly be the chase cards wherever they are released into. Especially now with cards like IP Mascarena and Borolode Savage Dragon, these cards have crazy price tags for just being ultra rares. I would absolutely expect them to be reprinted as secret rares in the Megatons, which would be absolutely amazing. They would be beautiful, especially if we get the Prismatic Secret Rare treatment like the tins got last year and we should be able to pick these up for either 20 to 30 dollars a piece which is literally like cutting the price of Borlaut Savage Dragon down by half. Now if you haven't already take a look at what cards you're holding on to from these sets and see if you have the opportunity to move things that you don't need before they get reprinted because Megatins are generally one of the times of the year that we can predict the reprints that we're going to be seeing a lot more easily so we can make some more proactive moves to save yourself a little bit of money. Alright guys, that is it for today's episode, so I've said it before and I will continue saying it now, it is really important that we be looking forward when it comes to the Yu-Gi-Oh market. A lot of the time we can look for opportunities to invest in certain things early on that will go up in price or move cards before they have a chance to tank down. One of the great things about Yu-Gi-Oh is that it can be a self-sustaining hobby. It doesn't have to be a drain on you financially if you're a little bit disciplined and you can look a little bit into the future. Anyways guys, if you did enjoy today's Market Watch episode, please be sure to hit that thumbs up button for me as it does help out a ton. Also make sure you leave a comment down below, let me know what else is going on with the market, maybe things that you have questions about, so I can potentially cover them in future episodes. And of course if you haven't already, make sure that you hit the subscribe button to get all of the latest and greatest content from both Tombox and myself here on the channel. And until next time guys, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV.